1967. And for once, Scotland's proud boast to be the best footballing nation on earth was actually true. We marked the emergence of Celtic as being a great European side. To beat England 3-2 at Wembley, it was probably the best result in Scottish history. As every fan knows, it made us the world champions because we've beaten the world champions. It was our moment. It portrayed Scottish football at its best. A city like Glasgow, with two teams, and they're both in the final of the major European competitions. We absolutely murdered them. We played them off the park. We gave Real Madrid a doing. An absolute going over. The gaffer made each one of us a better player. There was no doubt about that. We produced more good players in that era, proportionate to our population, than any other country in Europe. Eintracht and fabulous Real Madrid in white took the field on a never-to-be-forgotten evening at Hampden Park. Why 1967 became the year of the Scots has its roots firmly in the 1960 European Cup final played at Hampden Park, Glasgow, between Real Madrid and Eintracht Frankfurt. That was the day that changed everything. Real Madrid, inspired by Alfredo Di Stefano, produced a brand of football that fired the imagination of the Scottish public like nothing had before. Another storming Madrid attack. Loy only half saved. De Stefano banged it home. I think to everyone in the game, it was the greatest wake-up call that Scottish football's ever had. That game has let an insight into what football can be. I think the European Cup final in 1960 was a seminal moment in Scottish football. There is no doubt in the minds of anyone who saw Real Madrid and Eintracht that this was one of the greatest games they would ever see. What an amazing display De Stefano did give. Perhaps no other player in the world could have scored like this. I think we acquired a great taste for European football that night. Scottish football, I suppose, had been invested with a parochial feel. We were um, a nation obsessed by our own abilities at club level domestically. But I think we realised that night that this was the portal's opening to new horizons and possibly we could be up there with the best. <laughs> One in the crowd that evening who certainly saw those new horizons was Jock Steen, who just left Celtic for the manager's job at Dunfermline a month earlier. Steen, along with countless thousands of other Scottish boys, had learned his football on the streets, where, with hardly a television set between them, they played football hour after hour, day after day, after day after day. Football was a national obsession and we were producing people who were very good at that obsession. All of the rules that were part of the kind of almost the unwritten laws of playground football, which is you had to score great goals and great goals were goals that you dribbled and beat four guys or you did a banana kick or an overhead kick or a diving header. So there was this kind of hierarchy of greatness and Scottish players seemed to be able to thrive in that world. All the lads who came through into a Scotland international team or did well at club level had developed by playing football from morning till night in the streets. Jock Steen's greatest ability was in taking that raw football talent that had been honed on Scotland's streets and playgrounds and marrying it to tactics. It brought him immediate success. His Dunfermline team beat Celtic to win the Scottish Cup in 1961. And after a brief spell at Hibs, Steen was lured back to Celtic in early 1965 to replace Jimmy McGrory. Steen returned to a club mired in mediocrity. 
and without a league championship title to boast of in more than a decade, they looked incapable of winning one anytime soon. 19 minutes gone then, and it's United to Celtic no. Celtic were a shambles before Steen arrived. I don't think there's any question at all about that. Steen had his work cut out, and as he told reporters after watching his new team crash to a 6-2 defeat at Falkirk in April 1965, I see now why I've been brought here. That was a big shock. I mean, we never thought we'd go to Brockville and lose six goals against Falkirk. I mean, who else did Falkirk ever score six goals against? I mean, <laughs> I don't think they ever did it before that. But we got a going over, so there's no doubt about that. I mean, we played absolute garbage. Incredibly, seven of the players who played in that hammering at Falkirk would be in the team that would take European football by storm just two years later. Oh. It had been eight long years since Celtic had won a trophy. Within weeks of his appointment, Steen's team faced Dunfermline in the Scottish Cup final. Gallagher. Celtic won the cup, but they did it the hard way, coming from behind twice before captain Billy McNeil headed a late winner. And centre half Billy McNeil races up there to head in what could very well be the goal which will win the Scottish Cup for Celtic for the first time in 11 years. Jockstein, I think, was a breath of fresh air within the, the domestic game in Scotland. I think there were one or two other managers about his time, maybe just before him, who also were probably more famously known now as the tracksuit manager, um, the kind of first to leave the, the running of the club behind and trying to get out onto the pitch uh, to try and really train the players and, and, and work in tactics, etc. Steen's success was immediate. And in May 1966, Celtic won their first Scottish Championship in 12 years and qualified for the European Cup for the first time. <laughs> Employing a hands-on manager was attracting great interest among football people, even at the ultra-conservative SFA, who were still not convinced that having a full-time manager was ideal, let alone one who could be given responsibility for picking the team. They were thrashing round the SFA. At one stage they actually talked about um, suitable for someone who had another occupation. <laughs> so in other words, any, uh, <laughs> any um, butcher, baker or candlestick maker could have applied. The SFA concluded that a football manager would be the best person to become a football manager. And they appointed the St Johnston boss Bobby Brown and they even gave him the power to select his own players. My job was to pick the team and, as a result, meet the committee, explain to them why I had picked so-and-so, the reason for it, in full detail. There was no suggestion then of the committee interfering at all. This was a radical departure for the SFA, but it was in tune with the times. By the middle of the decade, the 60s were in full swing. A younger generation with money in their pockets were having their horizons broadened and experiencing and embracing new cultures. You had a sense, I think, more of being international, of being citizens of the world rather than just their own country. And I, I think that made a, a difference to how we, we saw ourselves. But thankfully, not everything changed. Scottish television could still host a traditional Hogmanay bash. And the Scottish press was still fixated with England's World Cup win as they blared in their January 1st issue that team manager Alf Ramsey was to become Sir Alf. But as the bell struck to usher in the new year of 1967, no one could have imagined the impact that Scotland would have on world football in the next 365 days. In 1967, it seemed the world was in turmoil. 
the Arabs and Israelis went to war. While across the globe there were mass protests against the war in Vietnam. And in America, race riots erupted in several major cities. In Scotland, there was a quiet revolution taking place on the football field. And the SFA's decision to appoint a full-time manager in Bobby Brown was about to be tested. Brown's first task was to pit his wits against Alf Ramsey, sorry, Sir Alf Ramsey's newly crowned world champions. It was England's first match at Wembley since winning the World Cup. Oh, joy. I think that uh, in order to understand 67, you have to first understand 66. I don't think there's any question of it that nobody up here would have, would have liked seeing... I'm not, nobody's an exaggeration, of course. Um, one or two people would. But the vast majority would have been very, very resentful about England winning a World Cup. And, of course, they did have the great excuse of... Um, saying that the triumph was tarnished because they played every match at Wembley, you know, and so it was a kind of tainted triumph, basically. The one element of dread I had, and I think maybe a lot of Scots had, is that we would hear about it, you know, forever and ever. 1967 came for us our chance to put the world to rights. Wembley, Bobby Moore and John Gregg were the captains. England versus Scotland. Neither Bobby, his team, nor England supporters believe Scotland had a chance. By the time we got to Wembley in 67, guys like Dennis Law and Jimmy Baxter and Billy Bremner and, uh, were very determined, uh, along with the rest of us, to, to try and beat the, the current world champions. New manager Bobby Brown had plenty of experienced international players to choose from and was expected to play safe with his team selection. Instead, the new manager took a massive gamble on a 21-year-old, uncapped Sheffield Wednesday player. I had watched a young lad, Jim McCallion, and I had been very impressed. Impressed at the way he could read the game, he could be a holding player if necessary. I knew that a lot of the selectors were watching me week in, week out at Sheffield Wednesday, and I was certainly in their minds. I was fingers crossed, I was hoping, uh, but things were looking good and it, was, it all seemed to be happening all around me. I thought I would take a chance with him. That proved to be the inspiration of the team. Jim McCalley was an unknown quantity because he had gone south as a 15-year-old, but uh, he fitted in superbly, and uh, he happens now to be the landlord of my local pub. <laughs> so the team was Ronnie Simpson, back four of Gemmell, Greg, McKinnon and Eddie McCready. Front three, Bremner, McCalley and Baxter. Up front... I'd hoped Jimmy Johnson would have played. He was hurt. I had no hesitation in playing Willie Wallace with Dennis Lowe and Lennox. And Jim McCallig shuttling back and forward, which he did magnificently. His team talk was very short and to the point. It says, gentlemen, you're playing the world champions on their own pitch today. Go out and make sure... You make a good job of it. He actually treated us like men, you know, like, you've a job to do. Let's go out. We, we, we know what you're all capable of doing. Go for it and surprise them. I remember Jim Baxter putting his arm around me. You're OK, son, I'll look after you. I thought, that's great. I, I remember Jimmy in the dressing room, just give me the ball, lads, and we'll be fine. Just everything you get me, just give me the ball, you know. He just filled the place with confidence, you know, it was great. But as the Scots set the ball rolling, it seemed a foregone conclusion that England would triumph again. After 19 games without defeat, England had the shock of their lives. Dennis Law scored for Scotland. Bremner had the ball. He passed to Law. To Lennox. And it was a Scots second goal. What a feeling that was. I've turned away, really excited, and I've started running. And I was that pleased because my dad was at the game, and I said, if I kept running, 
and they're running up beside them. So I was that I was really thrilled. All hopes of an equaliser were shattered by Jim McCallier. I was absolutely elated. A great match for McCallion, playing his first full international. It's a kind of indescribable moment, but I probably went through it in my mind's eye as a kid, but it actually happened. With the match in its later stages, Jim Baxter indulged in a bit of showmanship. His keepy uppy has become the defining image of that match for generations of Scots. One of the other players says to him, come on, Jim, sort it out, let's go and really beat them. And Jim Baxter turned around and said, no, it's always better just to take the piss, right? And there's something there about that returning back into the playground of Scottish football, where to take the piss was better than actually winning 4 nothing. To show off your skills was actually more important than actually scoring the extra goal. Jim's attitude was very Scottish, I think it the more essentially Scottish was was Jim's, which was uh, you don't just you know beat an opponent, you demean the opponent. <laughs> you show them how good you are. All of those values were values that were 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 learned in the playgrounds of the fifties in Scotland. History and the fans may have judged Baxter's ball juggling kindly, but at the time, many of his teammates who'd suffered at the hands of the English previously weren't happy. I can remember Dennis Law screaming at Baxter to get the ball moving to get more goals, right? So Baxter just keeps going like that. So there you go. Dennis uh, was in the team that got beat 9-3. So he wanted to get on with more goals and he he could obviously see more goals. I would rather have scored more goals. I would like to beat England 5-0 rather than... than, Jimmy being Jimmy, I mean, there's a lot of times you've seen them in the television they're passing the ball back and forth to each other. They were great, they kept the ball great from England. But I'd like to have won four or five nothing. Well, I was going berserk, really, because uh, at that time of the game, you, you never know whether a silly mistake what could result. And I said to him, Jim, I said I was having heart failure. He said, boss, he said I had plenty of time, I could have finished a fish supper. That was the inimitable Jim Baxter. Scotland had beaten the World Cup winners hands down. The game will go down to football history as one of the greatest that Scotland ever played. For thousands of their supporters, it was Wembley belongs to me. Turf and all. Somebody bunged Dennis money and we're saying, oh, buy the boys a drink, Dennis. I don't think he ever did, but he took the money off He took the money off anyway. To beat England 3-2 at Wembley, when, when you've got no chance, like lambs to the slaughter kind of thing, it was it was like, it was it was indescribable. You know, it was, it was out of this world. You know, to, to, we've done it, and the fans went crazy. It was probably the best result in the Scottish history. As the Scots celebrated their win with a meal in the Cafe Royal in central London, the manager decided to go for a walk to clear his head and reflect on his achievements. I saw this fellow coming along the road. He was obviously very merry. And there he was, staggering back and forward. He had his tartan scarf round his neck and his bonnet was right across his head and he was singing and he was as happy as anything. And he passed me and he suddenly stopped, came back, didn't know who I was, but he poked me in the chest and he said, See you! England 2, Scotland 3, and don't you ever forget it. Always remember that. It was almost a must-win game for the nation. It was. I often wonder that if we'd lost that game, might we as a nation have tipped into full-blown mental illness? Because you had this sense that, it's, that's, that in terms of the psychiatry of Scotland, of our well-being, we needed to prove after 1966 that we still had this mastery of the game of football. Having retaken ownership of the game in Britain in such typically gallus style, Scotland was now prepared to launch its brand of free... On Sunday, April 16th, as the hangovers kicked in all over the country, 
Scotland's Sunday newspapers consoled the population with the fact that they were indeed masters of this game of football. But more than that, in the latest stages of all three major European competitions, Scotland had more representatives than England, Germany, Spain or Italy. In the first leg of their Fairs Cup semi-final, Kilmarnock went down 4-2 to Leeds United at Elland Road, and despite a valiant effort, could only manage a draw at Rugby Park a fortnight later. I think they did great to get there. I mean, you think of what they achieved for a club as comparatively small as that. It was terrific. It was a remarkable achievement um, to go that far, and certainly no disgrace to be beaten by Leeds United, who were emerging uh, as one of the top teams in, in England under Don Revy. So I, I didn't uh, didn't repine too much. I just thought it was great to have achieved what we did achieve in that in that run. Rangers' run to the Cup Winners' Cup semi-final couldn't have been tougher, as they had to overcome the cup holders Borussia Dortmund early on. Wonderful goal by Johansson. I remember the Dortmund game because they had won the Cup Winners' Cup the year before. They beat Liverpool at Hamden and I was at the game and uh, we drew them in the first round and I knew we were in for a very, very hard game. Smith leaving up. Rangers won the tie 2-1. They had knocked out the cup holders, but things didn't get any easier as in the quarter-final they were paired with Spanish cup holders Real Zaragoza. Two matches and extra time failed to separate the teams and Rangers relied on the toss of a coin to progress to the semi-final. Now only Slavia Sofia stood between Rangers and the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup. I remember we went to Slav Sofia and that was a huge crowd. It was one of these big stadiums on a running track and I think they had about 90,000 there being for our blood. Uh, but we played really well and uh, we won one nothing, And then we came back, huge crowd at Ibrox, 80,000, and uh, we beat them one nothing, And uh, that was us in the final. Alex Willoughby's goal ensured Rangers would travel to Germany for the final. It would be the second time that decade that Rangers would contest the European Cup Winners' Cup final. Manager Scott Simon had already led Rangers to the 1961 final when they'd lost to Fiorentina. Simon's stewardship of Rangers harked back to a previous era and stood four square against the new thinking in football management. In short, Scott Simon was everything Steam was not. In these days, the manager there, he didn't just get the team organised, he ran the club. It was the manager who dealt with travel arrangements, everything like that, uh, other aspects of the club. So he was in his office most days, and the only time you really seen him was on a Tuesday and a Thursday, and then on a match day. He was always in a suit. He was never in a tracksuit. Uh, he never raised his voice. He never swore. He was old school. Old school, perhaps. But Scott Simon had led his team to another European final. Across the continent, though, all eyes were on the European Cup quarter final, where holders and six times European champions Real Madrid had been drawn against the previous year's winners, Inter Milan. This, declared the world's press, was the final before the final and the winners of this tie would almost certainly be crowned European champions in May. It was Inter who triumphed, beating Real home and away, and the Italian press proudly boasted that Inter had just secured their third European Cup. In the opinion of the world, it seemed the Czechoslovakian champions Dukla Prague and Celtic were simply playing for the right to be cannon fodder for Inter in May's final in Lisbon. The Duke of match was terrific because they were such high quality opposition as well. I mean, they had Joseph Mazepust, who was, I think he was twice European player of the year. I mean, he was a brilliant, brilliant player, Mazepust. Celtic really had to play well to beat them. 
it was a tremendous occasion. And it's a goal by Morris. Celtic battled to a 3-1 first leg victory in Glasgow, but the tie was far from over. And it took an unusually defensive backs to the wall display in Prague a fortnight later to secure a nil-nil draw and finish off Dukla. We'd done something that no other British team had done. We got to the European Cup final. We knew the rest of the season was going to be absolutely brilliant, as it was, because all of a sudden we became known, not just in our own country, we became known throughout Europe when that happened. Just four days after beating Dukla, Celtic went to Hampden to face Aberdeen in the Scottish Cup final. They were chasing an unprecedented quadruple. As the manager pointed out in his pre-final team talk, they were on the verge of great things, but as yet had won little. So let's make sure that we don't slip up with being casual, being careless and early in the game. So let's go now, Billy, and make sure that this is another game that will add to the rest of the victories we've had and it'll be a season we'll all remember. Two goals from Willie Wallace secured the win and Mission Impossible became merely Mission Improbable. All it would take would be a steady hand. We're saying to ourselves, we could win everything this year, right? And that's including the European Cup, because we were starting to get hyped up by this time, because everything fell into place for us. Thoughts of European glory were suspended, albeit temporarily, on May the 6th. Celtic and Rangers were both still in contention for the league championship. Jock Steen's men went to Ibrox, knowing that a point would be enough to win the title. I remember the weather. It was absolute murder. It was bucketing through the heavens high. Every minute the pitch was getting worse and worse and worse. That was a typical firm game only. The championship was up for stake. It was a ding-dong. There were spies in the crowd that afternoon at Ibrox. James Bond, a.k.a. Sean Connery, turned up to see his favourites although he actually turned out to be a double agent. And Helenio Herrera, manager of Inter Milan, took his only look at his cup final opponents. He learned little. Herrera came away after that, more or less telling the Italian press that uh, they had no problems. Uh, now, weather and conditions and what goes with an old firm game compared to, to Lisbon was, uh, it was a, another universe. Celtic had their draw and the domestic clean sweep of the League Cup, Scottish Cup and First Division Championship was complete. Confidence going into the European Cup final could not have been higher. <laughs> Throughout the month of May, tens of thousands of Scots packed up heavy overcoats, woolly hats and umbrellas and headed for the baking heat of a Portuguese summer. Remember, these were the early days of foreign travel. There was a whole group of Celtic supporters left for Lisbon before we left. I don't think that very many of those people knew how far away Lisbon was. But there was cars, buses, God knows, droves and droves and droves going. As an assortment of Hillman imps and Volkswagen camper vans snaked across Europe, Celtic flew into Lisbon and settled into their luxury hotel. In the days before the final, manager Jock Steen was telling anyone who'd listen that for Celtic, it was business as usual. He was almost acting a role. Uh, that he, he was so relaxed, and this was what he wanted uh, uh, to portray so that people didn't get uptight. 
And I remember he bought a hat in a shop and the Portuguese guy said, uh, your size is uh, whatever it was. And he said to the guy, yes, it was smaller this time last year. <laughs> Happy as Larry, he was up for it and very good with all the guys, having a bit of fun, a bit of banter and telling jokes here and a wee, wee song here. And it, was, it was really, you couldn't have been in a place that was more relaxed. Everything they did before the final was relaxed, and it seemed not even a most unsporting breach of etiquette by Inter could ruffle steam. We went to the ground. We were allowed a, a, a training spell on the ground, and Inter Milan sat and watched it. The big joke was as fly as a bag of monkeys, and uh, he says, show them nothing, right? We'll just do a few wee passing exercises, uh, we'll not do any shooting, we'll just do wee bit run-throughs and stuff like that, wee bit short and sharp stuff, show them nothing. And uh, <laughs> that was it, we showed them nothing. This remarkable photograph was taken in the seconds between them leaving the dressing room and going on to the pitch. And is the only hint that perhaps the tension was beginning to get to the players. Not one of them has the faintest memory of the photograph being taken. That was the team bus that we had got to the ground in, but I don't know what the, the photograph was all about. Yeah. I can't remember, that's amazing. amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that photograph. I honestly couldn't, couldn't explain why that photograph was taken. I don't know. On the evening of Thursday, May 25th, 1967, Jock Steen's Celtic team, the majority of whom played in the 6-2 drubbing by Falkirk just two years earlier, took the field against the mighty Inter Milan, twice winners of the European Cup. I looked at these Inter Milan players with the tan faces and magnificent strips and everything else. And then I looked around at our squad... <laughs> with the freckle faces and the white skins, and I said, oh, in the name of God. Wee Jinky tapped on the shoulder, he says, big man, he says, look at them. They're all film stars. I says, wee man, but can they play? Along comes, I've seen it a million times in film, it was. But I think that helped us because we were left with only one thing, is take the game to them. But taking the game to them probably didn't include using the goalkeeper as an extra central defender. What do I recall? I recall wanting to change my underwear. Oh, I think my heart just about packed in at that, that particular time, to be honest with you. The old ticker's gone like that, yeah. Oh, European Cup final, done one nil. I'll just back you, Lubo. <laughs> I says to him at half-time, I says, what's your game? He says, I knew exactly what I was doing. I says, well, I'll tell you, you're lucky, because we didn't know what you're doing. <laughs> First moment of my life. <laughs> it was absolutely, oh, fantastic. Celtic threw everything at Inter, and with just five minutes remaining, Stevie Chalmers popped up to score the goal that secured the win. When I went in, they basically chucked it. But their heads were really down, you know. It was they'd, they'd gone by the time we made it two one. Inter had gone. Fans just cascaded onto the park. It was 45 minutes before I could get into the dressing room. Big Jock says, right, right, Billy, you and Sean are going to get, go up and get the cup. And I, I said to myself, how are we going to get there? It was pandemonium in the dressing room that night. Bill Shankly came in as well. A uh, big joke could asked him down as a guest. Then came Bill Shankly, who definitely 
was James Cagney personified and there was a kind of almost not a silence but kind of everybody turned and he threw his arms up there and shouted John you're a mortal <laughs> and because uh, he never called Jock Steen Jock he always called him for some reason John the following morning, the team flew home with their prize, and it seemed like the whole of Glasgow had turned out to greet them. But what Celtic achieved in Lisbon resonated far beyond Glasgow. Celtic were representing something more than merely Scotland. They were representing traditions of football, uh, and traditions, I think, also of the value of the cavalier attacking spirit of football against this much more methodical, systemic kind of defensive game. And so for Celtic, the victory wasn't just a victory for Celtic Football Club, wasn't just a victory for Scotland. It sort of felt like a victory for attacking football. By May 1967, Scotland was on the brink of making history by having both of Europe's premier trophies residing in the same city at the same time. As Celtic returned triumphant from Lisbon, the Rangers squad, in a relaxed and confident mood, headed off to Germany to face Bayern Munich in the final of the Cup Winners' Cup. As Scotland held its breath in anticipation of more football success, the rest of the world had the audacity to continue as normal. In the summer of 1967, love and peace were the order of the day, as the hippie counterculture that had swept out of California reached Britain. Well, parts of Britain. Because in the summer of 1967, Scotland was simply football crazy. A small country like Scotland, a city like Glasgow, with two teams, and they're both in the final of the major European competitions. Uh, I ask you a question, will you ever see that again? But it was a big, 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 big thing for, for uh, Scottish football and a big thing for the city of Glasgow. Rangers knew that only a victory over Bayern Munich would be acceptable, not just to secure the club's first European trophy or to further enhance the reputation of Scottish football, but it would give them a share of the limelight that was being hogged by their greatest rivals. Pressure? What pressure? We were under a lot of pressure because we'd gone round for round with Celtic, us both winning uh, the respective rounds in the competitions we were in, and Celtic had won just a couple of weeks before us, I think, in, in, in uh, Lisbon. And that in itself put great pressure on us. It's hard enough playing in a final without the other side winning the, the big cup with the week before. So it, it was a lot of pressure. The players may have been able to handle the pressure, but Rangers' biggest handicap going into that final was entirely self-inflicted. They were operating without a recognised striker thanks to a crazy boardroom decision taken the previous January following a crazy Scottish Cup exit. It was a particularly strange season for Rangers in the fact that they had lost to Berwick Rangers in the Scottish Cup in the January, uh, a result that Scott Simon, the manager, described as the worst in, in the club's history. After Berwick, there was a kind of suicide almost by the, by the club. Strikers George McLean and Jim Forrest may have had a bad day in front of goal, but for reasons known only to Scott Simon and the Rangers' board of directors, they were singled out for the defeat at Berwick, and within weeks, both had been transferred out of Ibrox. Jim Forrest was breaking records every season for scoring goals, but he had a bad game that day. The whole team had a bad game that day, but they too carried the can for it. It was OK getting rid of these players, but we didn't have anybody, uh, uh, another centre-forward. The nearest either Forrest or McLean got to this final was appearing in the photograph on the front of the match day programme. So when Rangers arrived in Nuremberg, Scott Simon had a huge decision to make on his team selection. He gambled by playing a central defender, Roger Hind, 
as a striker. The final in Nuremberg Stadion was almost a home match for Bayern, but despite playing in front of 70,000 noisy Bavarians, Rangers started the match well and had most of the possession and the best of the chances. We absolutely murdered them. We did. We played them off the park. We were by far the better team. And we just couldn't score a goal. I think Scott Simon assumed that we're playing Roger Hind at centre forward. He would upset Franz Beckenbauer with his bustling style and his, his strength and all that kind of thing. But it didn't happen. The match finished goalless and went into extra time. Then, disaster struck. It was a big disappointment for us. The whole thing was a disappointment, you know. But the team played well. They really played well, I mean, you know. We actually felt as though we had tried so hard. We just couldn't score. It's unfair to criticise Roger. He gave it his best shot, but Roger wasn't a natural centre forward. So, and it's easy with hindsight, looking back, uh, it, was a, it was a bad decision for the club to let George McLean and uh, Jim Forrest go without maybe buying somebody else and bringing another natural centre forward in. John Gregg was crying, you know, he, he tears in his eyes and that kind of thing. I remember it was a, a huge dressing room just a concrete dressing room uh, because I remember walking in the door after the game and throwing my medal which was in a little cardboard box and it ricocheted off about two or three walls uh, I, didn't, I wasn't interested in it I, I, I'm still a bad loser Mr Simon was devastated I can remember him after the game he was in tears I felt sorry for him, because we let him down, we let the fans down. And it was, a, it was a terrible, terrible experience. The defeat in Nuremberg was to be one of Scott Simon's last matches as Rangers manager. I think he understood with Celtic winning and us getting beat, the additional pressure it would put on him and the club. If Rangers had won the, the Cup Winners' Cup, we would have been the first city in Europe to, to win the, the two trophies in a space of a week. And uh, Celtic came back to thousands of people. <laughs> we came back to a man and his dog. Had the season ended there, it would still have been a remarkable year for Scottish football. But there was one more match to be played which, although billed as a friendly, would put the reputation of Celtic, the new European champions, on the line. It was such an honour that the greatest player in the world wanted us to come and play in his testimonial. He disregarded everybody else. Alfredo Di Stefano, the Real Madrid legend, was retiring from football, and he'd asked Celtic to travel to Madrid to provide the opposition for his farewell match at the Bernabeu Stadium. I think for Steen and for Celtic it was prestige. And I think, too, he was determined to show the continent that it hadn't been a freak result in Lisbon. This was a huge gamble for Steen. He'd little to gain but plenty to lose by taking Celtic to Madrid to face the side who regarded themselves as the best team in Europe. The Madrid papers were really full of, we will prove you the champions, Celtic are just keeping the cup warm for us and all this kind of stuff. And they were really desperate to win that night. It was a real, real needle game. It was, it was one of the better games. It was a great game, actually, playing it. It was a vicious game. I mean, they were clogging each other, left, right and centre. There was no doubt that uh, Real wanted to win that game. It may have been De Stefano's testimonial, but the night belonged 
to another player. We Jinky gave their left back an absolute going over, gave him a doing, and the crowd, 135,000, every time we Jinky got the ball, they were chanting, Ole, Ole, every time and up to the, the fullback, we went past him at will, Ole, Ole. <laughs> We Jimmy was just his very, very best that night. He really was fantastic. Beating people and beating people. But I always remember saying to him, that doesn't win your game. Scoring goals win your games. And I get the goal, so, you know what I mean? The gaffer was thrilled at the time up and won that game. Absolutely thrilled. What a chance we took. But we took it. And we marked the emergence of Celtic as being a, a decent European side. It vindicated the final in Lisbon and it gave verification to a new force. Everything that happened, Big Jock was responsible for. Just seven years earlier, Jock Steen had been at Hamden to see Alfredo Di Stefano and Real Madrid lift the European Cup. Steen, inspired by the football he witnessed that night, had by 1967 built his own team capable of conquering Europe. And in the last match of that incredible season, Steen took his own brand of free-flowing, attacking football to Madrid to honour Di Stefano and proved that the students had become the masters. Nineteen sixty seven. The year the planets aligned, and for a brief moment in time, Scotland was the greatest football nation on earth. The style of the national team's victory over England at Wembley, the achievement of Kilmarnock getting to the semi final of the Fairs Cup, the dogged determination of Rangers in reaching the final of the Cup Winners' Cup against all odds, and of course, Celtic's swashbuckling display in Lisbon to become champions of Europe mean that 1967 will be forever remembered as the Year of the Scots. All sorts of other global events are going on, but somehow in our minds when we say the words 1967, all of those things fade into nothingness because you just go, ah, the football. 